Okay. Um, so we're beginning a new book, and even though 1 John only has five chapters, it is like the Gospel of John in that it is very deep and it's full of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. Now the Christians, since the death of Christ, have experienced many difficult situations. They've been expelled from the temple, they've been persecuted, and they've struggled with accepting the Gentiles as brothers and sisters in Christ. By the time 1 John is written, around 100 to 115 AD, they're living in communities as minorities throughout the world. This epistle is directed to those living in Asia Minor, centered around the city of Ephesus where John the Apostle lived. These Christians became known as the Johannine communities because they continued to teach what John had given them. 1 John, even though it is, it is called a letter, it does not have the structure of a letter. Scholars have differing opinions of its structure since it follows no clear plan. The author is repetitious and circular in his writing. He is not a linear thinker. Raymond Brown, who is the foremost authority on the books of John, believes that 1 John is an interpretation of the Gospel of John and therefore has the same divisions at, that correspond to the Gospel's divisions. So it begins with a prologue. Chapter 1, 1 to 4. Part 1, God is light and we must walk in the light. That's chapter 1, 5 to 3, 10. Part 2, walk as the children of the God who has loved us in Christ. Chapter 3, 11 to 5, 12. And then the conclusions. Chapter 5, 13 through 21. There's differing opinions on who wrote 1 John. In many respects, it follows the gospel in style, vocabulary, and ideas. However, it is not believed that John the Apostle wrote the epistle. It is believed that there are four different writers of the Johannine school. Of course, the beloved disciple John is the first, and he is the source of the tradition for all the other works. There was an evangelist who wrote the body of the gospel, the presbyter who wrote the epistles, the letters, and the redactor who edits the gospel. The importance of knowing who wrote the book is to know he wrote it under the authority of the apostle. However, what is most important is the message that the understanding of the nature and the role of Jesus, which unified the community, is now the very source of its division. The Gospel of John was written around 90 AD. It seemed that over a period of 10 to 15 years, people had accepted the Gospel, but now had started to interpret it differently. And it's easy to understand how this can happen. When people converted to Christianity, they brought with them their pagans' understanding of who God was, especially the Gentiles. And they brought philosophies that made it difficult to accept the entire gospel as it was taught. Therefore, they took from the gospel what they wanted, and they added their own belief systems to the gospel of John. The writer of 1 John was trying to correct those who had distorted John's gospel, especially his teaching on who Jesus was and what he revealed about God. The writer is making it very clear that we cannot create God from our finite knowledge. Instead, we are to adhere to the teachings taught from the very beginning. While the prologue of the Gospel of John emphasizes the pre-existence of the Word, the prologue of 1 John is a testament of the Apostle's witness to the incarnation of the Word in which he experienced the human career of Jesus. The author is emphasizing that what was preached was what the Apostle heard, saw, touched, and that truth was handed on to them. Therefore, it is the authentic teaching and there is no other. The intent of 1 John is intense religious conviction expressed in the simple truth of John's Gospel. It is also an invitation for those who have distorted the teachings to repent and return so that the community's joy may be complete. 
To understand 1 John, you have to understand a little bit about the heresies that were beginning to develop in this time. There are two groups that this letter is addressed to, and basically they were different forms of the Gnostics. One group will develop into the Docetism, and the other continue to be called Gnostics. Docetism comes from the Greek word doke, meaning to seem. Uh, they believed in the divinity of Jesus as the Son of God, but they denied his humanity. They believed that the material body was evil, therefore God could not take on a human body because he was good. So basically they are saying if Jesus is good, then the incarnation is impossible for God because the body is evil. Therefore, Jesus assumed a human appearance, but it was imaginary, as was his suffering, death, and resurrection. It was all an illusion. The central idea of docetism was that if Christ was God, it was impossible for him to suffer, and if he suffered, then he wasn't divine. So they denied the birth, suffering, death, resurrection of Jesus. And it went further than that. St. Ignatius of Antioch wrote in 110 about the same time about the docetism. And he says, The docetists abstain from the Eucharist and from prayer because they confess not the Eucharist to be the flesh of our Savior Jesus Christ, which suffered for our sins and which the Father of his goodness raised up again. They who deny the gift of God are perishing in their disputes. There's another quote from Gregory who said, What is not assumed is not healed. Meaning, if God did not become fully human, if he didn't assume a human body, he could not truly save humanity. He couldn't be healed. The only way God could bring us back into unity with him was through our humanity because it is through our humanity that we sinned against God. It had to be healed in the incarnation of Jesus. It was impossible for humans to do it on our own. 1 John responds to this heresy directly in chapter 4 where he says to test the spirit to see if it is of God. Only those that acknowledge Jesus Christ come in the flesh belong to God, and those that don't acknowledge him in the flesh are the Antichrist. Very strong words. Docetism remained a threat for the church in various forms until the movement was destroyed by the Albigensian Crusade in 1209 to 1229. Today, we actually have kind of the opposite of this heresy. There are many people who accept Jesus' humanity, and they say he is a great prophet, but he is not God. Some examples are, are the Mormons and Islam. The other subversive group is the Gnostics. Gnosticism is a very complex philosophy that veers off in many different directions and it attaches itself to many different religions. For our study, we basically need to know that it comes from the Greek word kenosis, meaning secret knowledge. They believed that the spirit that was of God was trapped in this material body that was evil and that through this secret knowledge they could gain union with God. For them the body did not matter, only the secret knowledge. Therefore they believed they could live and do anything they wanted as long as they had this knowledge they would be saved. Salvation was secure and could not be lost as long as they had this knowledge. Now, I looked for this knowledge on the internet, and I could not find it. So I'm sorry I don't have that secret knowledge for y'all, but uh, Gnosticism is, is still with us today. A few years ago, we saw this heresy in the book and the movie, The Da Vinci Code. That was a Gnostic heresy. Uh, we also see it in some of the New Age religions and in Christian communities that preach, once you declare that Jesus is your Lord and Savior, your, salva your salvation is secured no matter what you do. Uh, 1 John, John addresses this distorted thinking in chapter 2 when he says that whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. 
So the author is saying if you really had knowledge of God, you would live your life according to that knowledge. If you do not live accordingly, you will lose your salvation. Salvation can be lost due to our free will. God does not force himself on anyone. We have to choose, and in choosing we walk in the light. Salvation is a gift, but we have to accept and open that gift and live it to the best of our ability to be worthy of eternity. Knowing is not enough. The spirit of truth has to live in each of us, and we have to put it into action. For the Gnostics, this was not so. They were living very immoral lives and denied that they were sinning because the body was evil and outside of God. For them, there was no sin and no responsibility to live according to the teachings of Christ. In verse 1, 8 to 10, the notion of sin is clarified. If we say we are without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we say we have not, not sinned, we make God a liar and his word is not in us. Bishop Sheen said that the greatest sin of the 20th century is the denial that sin exists. We have all sinned, but we do not realize what we are doing to God when we sin. There are saints who have had a vision of one venial sin, a small sin, and they have testified that if the vision had not been taken from, from them, they would have died from the fright of it. God and sin cannot exist in the same place. It's like putting vinegar into oil. It just doesn't mix well. Just last Thursday, we were studying the Sacrament of Reconciliation in the RCIA, and I had a Catholic come up to me and tell me, well, we don't have to confess our venial sins. Sin is sin, and it destroys our relationship with God. Venial sin needs to be taken seriously because they tend to mount up and weaken the will to the point that the will accepts greater and more serious sin. We see this in our society every day. If we took adults from 50 years ago and had them watch TV, they'd be horrified. There would be such an outcry. The TV stations would be shut down. But it has been introduced a little at a time, and we've accepted it, and it continues to get worse and worse. This is the danger of sin. It is sly, and it is quiet, and it creeps in without us realizing it until it's a cancer eating away at our souls. One John is speaking loud and clear on this subject. We need to take sin seriously. We need to do something about it. Earlier I told you how the prologue of John differs from 1 John in that the gospel emphasizes the word and the incarnation and 1 John focuses on the testimony of John to the humanity and the truth that Jesus revealed. There are a few other differences in the composition that I'd like to point out to you. 1 John assigns to God attribute, attributes that the gospel assigns to Christ. God is light. God gives the commandment of love. 1 John does not use the word paraclete to describe the third person of the Trinity. Instead, he applies it to Christ as the advocate between God and man. The epistle also warns that every spirit is not the spirit of truth and therefore should be tested by acknowledging that Jesus Christ come in the flesh belongs to God. 1 John also emphasizes the final eschatology to remain in Christ so that when he comes, we have confidence and not be put to shame. In other words, we'll be ready when Jesus comes the second time. I'm sure we're going to cover all of these topics in the weeks to come, but for now I'd like to use the remaining time to speak about the teaching that is central to the Johannine theology, which is the love of God. It is only in 1 John that it is stated, God is love. 
You'll not find those three words anywhere else in the Bible. So what is this love? I think it's important for us to have a very clear understanding of what the word love means when we say God is love. In English, we are hampered by the word love because we use it so easily to mean so many different degrees of love that it sometimes does not give us a true insight into what the heart is really wanting to say. We say we love ice cream, we love football, we love our children, we love our spouse, and we love God. For us, it's an expression of how we feel about something or someone. But for God, it is who he is and it is what he does. The Greeks had many more words to describe the various intensities in the relationships involved in love. They used the word philio to mean brotherly love, the love you have for a friend. They used dorge, this is the love for a relative. They use eros to describe sexual or romantic love. But the word agape, this is the deepest and the truest form of love, and it's based on doing good for the other. Agape is the word to describe the love of God. This love is total, faithful, fruitful, unconditional, self-sacrificing, and life-giving. This love that is God is not just a feeling. When God created us in the beginning before sin, there was perfect harmony between man and woman. Why? Because we were, we were created in his image, and that image is love. The will was to direct and control our passions and our feelings. With sin, all of this was distorted, so that many times our feelings and our passion directs our will. Transforming love cannot abide in a person if this happens because feelings and passions are directed toward the self. True love, perfect love, is total, faithful, unconditional, self-sacrificing, and life-giving to God and to others. 1 John is an invitation to us to enter into this Trinitarian relationship that will, will result in each of us being love and living love. Chapter 4, 16, 17 is worth memorizing. God is love, and whoever remains in love remains in God, and God in him. And this is love brought to perfection among us. How does this happen? Mankind is the only creature that can give himself to others in love. That is why God looked at Adam and said, it is very good. He saw his reflection in Adam to love. The greatness of mankind is measured by his ability to love. When we die, Jesus is not going to say, how many houses did you have? How many cars did you own? He's going to look at how did we love. I have wrestled with trying to love as God loves for a long time. What I now understand is it isn't about me learning how to love. It is about me saying yes to allowing God's love to move through me. I'm going to tell you a story of how I kind of learned this. And it's from St. Francis. St. Francis had a great fear of leopards. And I understood when God asked me to do something that it was my fears that were keeping me from love. So St. Francis, through time and, and experience, became acquainted with God's love more and more to the point that one day he went up and he kissed a leopard and he gave him his clothes. And so whenever I have a difficult situation that God asks me and that fear comes up, I just say, I got to kiss a leopard today. And believe me, I have kissed a lot of leopards. <laughs> and I will continue to kiss leopards for the rest of my life. But that image, and I imagine it in my mind, gives me the courage to move on. And that's what love does. It gives you all the virtues you need to do what you need to do. 
If God is asking, he is giving. I think the best way for you to understand this kind of love is to also share with you some examples of this lived out in our society because it is so different from what the world says. Elizabeth Ann Seton, husband, died leaving her with five children. In addition to raising her five children alone, she started a girl's school, formed orphanages, and began a religious order. How could she do this? In 1902, an 11-year-old Maria Goretti was stabbed 14 times by a 20-year-old man because she refused his sexual advances. She lived through the surgery without anesthesia and died 20 hours after the attack. Before she died, she forgave her assailant and said she wanted him in heaven with her. How could she say this? How could Thomas More choose death rather than giving in to Henry VIII's demands to break away from his Catholic faith? How could he do this? In 2006, a milkman backed his truck up to a school of Amish children and shot ten girls, killing five, injuring five, and then killing himself. The response of the Amish community was a shock to everyone. That day, they forgave the shooter and went to his widow to express their heartfelt sorrow for her and her children. How could they do this? The wife of the shooter wrote an open letter to her Amish neighbors, thanking them for their forgiveness, grace, and mercy. She wrote, Your love for our family has helped to provide the healing we so desperately needed. Gifts you've given have touched our hearts in a way no words can describe. Your compassion has reached beyond our family, beyond our community, and is changing our world. And for this, we sincerely thank you. How could she say that? Jesus, hanging on the cross, said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. How could he say that? The love of God had transformed the hearts of all these people so that from their experience of suffering, they returned love into the world. We all have our crosses, whether it is to care for a family, defend a morality, hang, hang on to our faith, or forgive someone who has harmed us. We have a choice. Do we allow our emotions to take over creating bitterness and anger that result in more evil? Or do we go to the cross with Jesus and allow the love of the Father to transform our hearts so we can say, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Perfect love is the love of God living in a heart that gives it to others to create the kingdom of God here on earth. It is a simple fiat. It's not easy, but it's beautiful, and it can transform the world. One John invites us to walk in the light, to see as God sees, and to choose love. Love is who God is. And love is what God does. Love should be who we are. And love should be what we do. St. Augustine put it this way. When you want to know if you lead a life of grace, if God is your friend, whether you are a disciple of Christ, and whether you, you live in his spirit, examine yourself. Look and observe if you love others as your brothers and sisters. Do you love all people because of God? Then you will have your answer. May 1 John open our hearts to all the Holy Spirit wants to give us through the incarnation of Jesus Christ. Amen.